This is Beersmith episode number 105, and it's early June 2015. Dr. Charlie Bamforth, Distinguished Professor of Brewing Science at the University of California at Davis, joins me this week to talk about malt. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're now offering a full six issues a year, up from four at a great discount. They're offering a new discount code now, which gives you 15% off everything they sell, including subscriptions and training. The new code is Beersmith2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for home brewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 to get your 15% discount today. And this week, I'll mention the How to Brew video series I shot with John Palmer, author of the top-selling book, How to Brew. John and I have full-length videos on extract and all-grain brewing that are a great introduction for anyone interested in learning to brew or making the transition to all-grain. You can view the trailers and order these videos online or on DVD by going to beersmith.com slash DVD. Again, that's beersmith.com slash DVD. And now let's jump into this week's episode. This week, my guest is Dr. Charlie Bamforth, Distinguished Professor of Brewing and Distilling at the University of California at Davis. Dr. Bamforth has been on at least five times before for podcasts 14, 23, 31, 58, and 74. We last had him on discussing uh, flavor stability in January of 2014. Uh, Charlie, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Always a pleasure. Nice to be back. So it, it's hard to believe it's been over a year since I last had you on the show. Uh, what are some of the new projects you're working on? I think you got a new position, right? Well, I am uh, now the president of the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. So uh, that takes me over to uh, the UK quite a lot, uh, back to my home country. Um for meetings and so on, and, and also uh, events all around the world. We were down in Mozambique recently to the uh, the African Section Convention. So it uh, it occupies a lot of time, but uh, mostly it's fun and uh, it's good to put back. Do you uh, still get to teach a little bit? Oh, yeah, I'm still teaching plenty. I'm, I'm actually uh, slowly uh, handing over some of those responsibilities to other people. But, uh, yeah, still like to be involved in teaching on campus, but also the uh, extension program. Uh, and so um, one of the things I'm, I'm now teaching, after a few years, is this, these one-week classes, Introduction to Practical Brewing. So, um, you know, the listeners might like to take a look at that at my website. and uh, Yeah, I'll pull up. There's they, your website right there. Uh, yeah, so they go into short courses. I think it says on the left-hand side, uh, just just go there and uh, and then you can actually uh, link through and see whether one of these one-week classes might suit you. You get to brew in, in our one-and-a-half-barrel brewery and uh, also uh, on a smaller scale as well, as well as listening to me. Um, in uh, in a classroom for um, a few days, and then and again opportunity to present your beer for critical acclaim to the class at the end of the week. Not, not the beer you brew there, but the beer you brought in from uh, home as well. So it's all it's all good fun. That's really cool. So you're in addition to obviously obviously you have the graduate work and you have the undergraduate work, but you're now offering short courses as well, huh? Well, we do, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, we. Uh, we enjoy it and uh, you get to brew with my brewer, Joe Williams and so on. So yeah, it's, it's all good stuff. Yeah. So if you want to pull up that website, if you, if you just Google Charlie Bamforth, probably the easiest way to find it, um, it comes up right at the top. Uh, it's, uh, it's under ucdavis.edu. Um, I wanted to mention uh, uh, this week you want to discuss malt and its huge impact on beer. And yeah. uh, even though malting is a really long process, uh, Surprisingly, raw malts are not a huge percentage of the price of the finished beer. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and of course, it depends very much on the the size of the company. But uh, I think possibly the data you've seen uh, relates to sort of the very the bigger companies, where mm -hmm. you know, for a bottle of, a bottle of beer, the most expensive thing is the bottle and uh, putting the beer into the bottle and marketing that bottle and the tax on that bottle um, and uh, and so on. So uh, the raw materials like the malt actually are, you know, relatively lower cost contributors to the, the price of a bottle of beer on a larger scale. Obviously, if you're, you're brewing on a much smaller scale, you know, you, you take a look at the price of a bag of malt and you think, oh my, yeah, that's, that's a lot of money and you want to make the most of it. So it does really depend on the scale, but, but certainly for many, for much of the beer that's brewed in the world, the, the actual cost contribution of malt 
despite the fact that it has a huge impact on, on uh, the product, the actual cost of the malt is relatively low. Now, we're, uh, at one time, we were seeing a major shift where large breweries were moving away from barley malt uh, and started using a lot of adjuncts. But now uh, we're seeing craft breweries uh, driving things sort of the other way and driving us back towards 100% barley malt beer. Yeah, very much uh, so. There, uh, there, there's still a very strong um, belief set um, that really the best beers are the ones that are made from 100% malt or whatever types of malt it is. Um, I... Of course, uh, you know I'm f- fully of the opinion that there are, there are many very respectable beers that have uh, have got other components in them as well, and and uh, uh, and you know just because the word adjunct is used doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing by any means. You know I, I'm always amused by the fact that uh, you know a Trappist monk puts candy sugar into a kettle, and uh, that's deemed a, a wonderful thing to do. But if the word sugar is used in anybody else's context, it, it, it sort of gets um, abused. So, so I find it interesting that, uh, you know, Trappist monks using sugar is, is a damn good thing. But, uh, you know, uh, bulls gonads going into Rocky Mountain Oyster Stout is, is somehow uh, also a very good thing, whereas rice and corn are not. So, uh, uh, but yeah, in answer to your direct question, uh, malt is uh, is always a key component of a product and uh, some of the most excellent beers of course are the ones that are 100 percent malt mm-hmm. and uh for adjuncts the big breweries breweries primarily use uh rice and corn is that the main adjuncts that they use uh there are three main adjuncts that are used worldwide um rice of course is a, a very well-known brewing company in, in in north america that uses rice and of course rice is used in in uh uh, certain Asian countries as well. Corn uh, is uh, widely used by many brewers. Uh, particularly, and the third type of adjunct that I usually refer to is uh, is hydrolyzed corn. So, uh, you know, in, in a sugar factory, they will take the corn and uh, hydrolyze it using enzymes to produce sugars. And uh, you get, you produce products like high maltose syrup. And uh, to be perfectly frank, you know, I used to work for a very well-known brewing company in the UK, and we we used to use uh, high maltose syrup, about 20% of the grist. So it was 80, 80% malt, 20% high maltose syrup. And one of the main reasons you used it, you can put it actually into the boiling stage. You 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 don't obviously need to go through a mash tun or a, a louter tun. You you actually can put it straight into the boiling stage, and it will extend the amount of work you've got. So you'll actually produce uh, that little bit extra um, material to ferment and, uh, and produce beer. And as long as you don't use too much, there's plenty of goodness, both uh, nutritionally for the yeast, uh, but also um, in terms of all the malt benefits. There's plenty from that 80% of malt. Uh, uh, so, so the twenty percent of, of high maltose syrup, which has got a sugar spectrum very much mm-hmm. like uh, the sugar spectrum in all malt wort, uh, that that gives you a little bit extra to to play with, and uh, we felt it was a, a very sensible way to uh, to progress. Now, do these uh, additives typically add a lot of flavor to the beer, or no? Um, no well, not of themselves. No, they don't. But uh, that's not to say they don't have flavor advantages. Um, a lot of people think, well, something like rice is used just because it's cheaper. Actually, it's not necessarily cheaper because there's a lot of effort goes into um, the actual breeding of it, the growing of it, the actual milling process, which is very c- complex. And, of course, uh, it actually is more complex to use it in, in a, a brew house because you have to have that separate um, cooking stage, that cereal cooker stage. So actually, it's it's a more complex thing to use than just using malt alone. The real reason for using it, of course, is to, let's be frank, to get a gentler flavor and to take away some of the more astringent character that can come from the husk of, of the malted barley. And so you do get a lighter color and you do get a lighter flavor. Um, and as I've said probably on this show before, you know, if you like beers made that way, that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, you know, everybody has their own preferences about beer style. But the real reason for using an adjunct such as rice would be uh, for those uh, reasons of, of making the product lighter in color and flavor. Uh, that's much bigger driver than any cost 
like that. Well, turning back to uh, malted barley, can you explain to us the rather involved process of taking uh, raw barley and turning it into malted grain? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's uh, it, it's, a, it's a very long, or it can be a very long process, depending on where the barley is grown. So, if you're growing your barley in a in a damp and uh, coldish region like Northern Europe, and as an Englishman, I usually say a cold, miserable place like Scotland, but I, I I'm only teasing. Um, <laughs> They, uh, you know, then the chances are the barley is a. You're going to have to dry it uh, because it's going to have too much water in it, and the second thing is it, it's likely to be dormant, uh, which means that it, uh, it it's not going to sprout straight away. It uh, it's got inherent uh, protection in it to prevent it from sprouting on the ear uh, in in the field. Uh, if, if there's a lot of water around, in, in a lot of rain and, and damp and so on, then the risk is the barley will start to sprout prematurely on the on the ear. So there's an in, inherent mm -hmm. protection mechanism called dormancy which stops that from happening. And all you can do if, if you've got this barley grown in these damper regions, the first thing you do is you do dry them. And how do you dry them? Very carefully so you don't kill it. And then you have to just store the barley until this dormancy uh, is broken. It, just by natural storage, uh, the grain will mature and now be able to be um, germinated. So how, so how long does that take just, to, that, just well, for it the... On, it depends on how dormant it is. You know, it, it could be a few weeks, but it could be a, a, you know, several months. Uh, you can try to speed it up by keep it, getting it a little bit warmer. Uh, a little bit warmer than, say, ambient storage. So you might go up to something like 30 degrees centigrade, but uh, not much more than that because you run the risk of damaging the grain. Mm -hmm. Dormancy is, is not usually and seldom a problem in North America. Um, so when the barley is harvested, of course, uh, then um, it, is, uh, it, it is then taken to uh, the malt house. Uh, this is the, the equivalent of the, the winemaker's crush, uh, you know, where all hell is let loose for a few weeks. And of course, where uh, the barley harvest time, then the barley is going to be uh, delivered. And at the malt house, the first thing that's got to happen is it's got to be checked. It's got to be checked to make sure it's nice and clean and wholesome. Mm -hmm and there's no risk of any contamination, then you've got to do a quick viability check to make sure it's alive. And what happens is the grain is, is sliced in half and the embryo is stained with a dye. And, and if it turns pink, then okay, it's alive. And as long as it uh, has the right amount of moisture, not too much and not too little, and it should typically be about 12%. And as long as it's got uh, the right amount of protein, because the, you don't want too much protein, because the more protein means the less starch. So those things are very quickly checked. And it's done using something called NIR. It's a very quick spectroscopic way of doing it. And within seconds, you've got an answer for how much water and how much protein is in the grain. If everything is okay, then it will be, uh, it will be downloaded. And uh, so, you know, a lot happens even before you've actually started the malting process. The first stage of that malting process uh, is the, the grain is steeped in water. Um, and it's not just one batch of water. What, what happens is the grain is steeped in water for a few hours and then the water mm -hmm. is drained away and, and air is uh, brought through the grain to allow it to breathe. And then you add some more water and maybe another air rest as well. And what you're doing is raising the level of water from about 12% up to about you know, mid 40s, um, 44, 45, something like that percent. Um, and of course, you, you're actually producing a lot of waste water in that process. So clearly, there's an environmental uh, concern here. Mm -hmm. um, the chances are the last steep, uh, last steep water will be used to uh, steep in the next batch of grain. And then once the grain has been raised, the appropriate uh, moisture content, now it's able to start uh, germinating. So the, the grain is transferred to a, a germination vessel. And of course, there's a great passion in the craft sector in North America for having what is called floor malted grain, which means that the grain is basically spread onto, there you go. Yeah, I pulled up a picture here on the, yeah. on the video, spread so on are you talking floors. about it? Yeah, and spread onto the floors, and, and some guy will patrol these, uh, this grain bed, and he'll rake it, and he'll make it nice and even, and if it needs to warm up a bit, he'll, he'll shovel it into piles. and It's all very historic and charming. I'm, I'm not personally convinced that it makes better malt than that done in a pneumatic system, but, you know, that's 
wonderful stories you can tell about it. Floor malted Maris Otter. Ah, and people get all sort of damp around the eyes and excited and um, and have another beer, which is a good thing. Um, by the way, if you're doing the floor malting, it's very thirsty work. So, you know, you do get pain in beer almost. Um, mm-hmm. So this uh, modern malting systems are more pneumatic systems. They may be f- uh, in large towers with big uh, cylindrical, uh, cylindrical vessels with uh, arms that are going through and rotating the grain and making sure that it's nice and open and the, the rootlets are not mat, uh, matting. So over a period of several days, the, the grain starts to, uh, to germinate. And of course, while it's uh, sprouting, uh, it's actually producing the enzymes that are needed to soften the grain. And of course, the enzymes which later on uh, will be used by the brewer in the brew house to actually break down the starch. So after several days, uh, then the grain uh, is going to be transferred to a kiln. And this is uh, in order that the moisture content can be lowered. If you didn't lower the moisture content, uh, the grain would just carry on germinating. Um, but So you've got to drive off that, that water, and you have to do it carefully because enzymes are sensitive to heat. And if you just put in too much heat, you'll kill off the more sensitive enzymes. So what happens is that the, the, it's done by blowing air through the, the malt, and uh, that air at first is fairly low temperature so that you're driving off the water without allowing the grain to uh, have its uh, temperature build up. And then progressively, as the water level is lowered, the enzymes are are now more resistant to heat. So now you can start to progressively raise the temperature um, to drive off the final moisture, uh, but still to preserve the enzymes that are needed in the brew house, particularly the ones that break down the starch. And uh, the other thing, of course, that's happening on the kiln is that the sugars um, that are produced during germination and also what we call the amino acids, which are produced from breaking down the proteins, uh, they, are with heat, they uh, meld together, they react together, and they give you um, uh, color and they give you more flavor. And so the more intensely you heat the grain, the more color you develop and the more flavor you develop. So a Pilsner malt, which is dried very gently, Mm-hmm. Um, will have a very light color and a very light sort of toasty, very light flavor. Uh, whereas at the other extreme, you have the specialty malts that can be up to the sort of the black malts with intense color and intense flavor. But of course, those black malts, which are in, in, uh, heated to a huge temperature, uh, they don't contain any enzymes. So you, you, you always <laughs> have your main malt in a brew is a pale malt to provide the enzymes uh, but you have these so-called specialty malts that are more intensely heated to provide extra color and flavor. And then, of course, the last thing is somebody has to store that malt because you can't use it straight away. It has to be, um, it has to be stored uh, for typically for about a month uh, before you can brew with it because if you tried to brew with malt straight off the kiln, uh, then uh, that liquid, that wort, is not going to flow easily from the grain bed. You, you're going to have very great problems with what we call wort separation or, or loitering. Mm-hmm. So, so the very last stage, if you like, whether it's carried out by the malt store or carried out by the brewer, is somebody has to store that malt. Now, each malt house uses their own times, temperatures, uh, uh, base grains. Uh, so one pale malt really isn't necessarily equivalent to another pale malt, right? Uh, true, true. I mean, all malt will have a specification. And so there are specifications for its moisture content, its protein, its uh, color, and of course, uh, the extractable material uh, that you can get from it, what we call the hot water extract. But, you know, depending precisely on your steeping conditions and the germination conditions and the kilning uh, process, you can, you can play lots of tunes on, on the same grain. Obviously, the variety of the barley is important, and you get extremes you get the really good malting varieties and you get the much poorer varieties the feed varieties and so on Uh, but even within one variety depending on how you steep it and and for example how you germinate it what temperature for how long and then your kilning particularly your kilning cycle um, will have a a a profound effect on on the product Um, 
But of course, you uh, you know, a maltster will will have specifications for the barley, and the brewer will uh, have the specifications that he or she wants to see in that malt, um, and um, you know, those specifications will specify the sorts of things that I've just uh, talked about. The tendency is for brewers. Um, to be naughty people. Uh, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. You know, there's a long-standing adage, you know, if, if anybody's to blame, it's the maltster. Uh, and I really hate that. I really don't like it. But there's a tendency over the years for brewers to blame the maltster um, and say, well, this goes wrong. It's because of the malt. Oh, that goes wrong. It's because of the malt. And one of the problems is Brewers, uh, they keep piling more and more of these specifications onto the malt. So you get a long list of things um, that the, the brewer, sorry, the maltster has to achieve, the maltster has to deliver. And some of them are, are not easy to, they're not really compatible. You know, some things you, you increase one thing, you're going to change another one. And the risk is it's going to go away from what you want. So brewers do have a tendency to blame the maltster, and my recommendation is you should keep that specification as simple as possible, and realize that you know when you think of what is a maltster doing, a maltster is actually cultivating millions and millions and millions of little plants. Um, it's a, it's a, it's you know, it, and therefore it is an, an industry which is. No, it's it's very charming, and maltsters are very special people, and they're very touchy feely, and they they go and they grab hold of a handful of malt and they caress it between their hands and squeeze it and 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 <laughs> fertile it, as we say in England, to make sure it's ideal. And then, of course, it goes to a brewer, and the first thing the brewer does is grind the damn thing up. You know, I mean, it's brutal. Um, so I'm I'm being a little bit facetious, but uh, my my. I, I, I always sympathize with the malts because they have one hell of a job to do, to produce what we call a homogeneous malt, a malt which is consistent, that, 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 that as, as much of that, millions of grains, uh, of, of as many of them as possible, are basically identical. And that's a very great challenge. Yeah, I mean, you even have variations from season to season, right? I, I understand last year was a bit of a tough season for some of the, uh, some of the barley growers, for example. Well, it was, and you know, last year, season uh, w there was a problem with this uh, sprouting, this pre-harvest germination. So things were going wrong. The, the, this this uh, hormonal control system within the barley does fail sometimes, and to an extent that happened uh, last year. Um, and you, there was this uh, people call it uh, pre-germination or pre-harvest sprouting going on, and that's not good for 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 barley quality and therefore not good for the, uh, the the maltster and great challenges to actually produce good quality malt. And the fact that they do it is really testimony to their, their tremendous ability. You know, I mean, their tremendous ability. Well, going back to the beer, obviously uh, some people do prefer the taste of all malt beer and say they can taste the difference. Um, how does malt drive the flavor in the beer? In, in various ways. The, the first, of course, uh, is this, the classic malty flavor. Um, people say, well, what is, malt, what is malty flavor? Uh, and when people talk about malt flavor, they're usually thinking, um, you know, whoppers. You know, you, you have, you know, the, 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 the candy with the chocolate around the side and the candy on the, and the malty inside. That's the malty flavor. If you have cornflakes, they taste of malt. They don't taste of corn. They taste of malt. So the, in making cornflakes, they put malt extract on there as a source of flavor. And many breads and, and, and cookies have got this malty flavor. Um, then, of course, there, there are, as the flavor contribution for the more intensely dried malts, the so-called specialty malts. So you go through things like the, the caramel malts, which have got the kind of mellow, chewy, toffee-like, uh, candy-like characters. Um, and then right the way through to the uh, more intensely, most intensely dried specialty malts, the chocolate malts mm -hmm. and the black malts, which of course have got more of a, a coffee, uh, a dark chocolate, mocha, uh, the burnt character. And they're course, actually roasted, right? I mean, they're they are brought to a very high temperature, yeah. Yeah, so there's two, basically two ways <laughs> of making these specialty malts. The, the sort of the caramel malts, the crystal malts, they're made 
by at the end of the germination, allowing the temperature to rise quite considerably so that you really speed up the rate, the way, the rate at which the sugars and the amino acids are being produced. And then you uh, kill them uh, and you uh, o over a regime where they go to a significantly higher temperature than you would for a pale malt. And now that's when you get uh, substantial color, but you do get these, these um, more forgiving, should we say, mellow characters, but, but rich in, in uh, uh, sweetness, caramel, uh, toffee-like notes. I like, to, I like to think of it almost like you're almost mashing the, uh, yeah. the, the grain yeah. while it's still in the husk, right? Yeah, that's right. And, 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 then, then, you're, and then you're heating it up to the point where it's uh, caramelized, right? Correct. And so yeah. what you're getting is, uh, are those sorts of reactions taking place that you would get if you were making certain types of candy. Mm -hmm. um, but with a uh, with the black malts and the chocolate malts and the black malts, what you're doing is taking the final uh, dried malt from a kiln and then you're transferring it to a roasting drum, uh, just like if you were roasting coffee beans or something like that. And now you are there's a whole different chemistry going on, and you're getting these very intense uh, colours and very intense, much harsher character uh, products. So the, the caramel type malts, of course, are going to be going into the sort of the brown ales and the, the darker, um, perhaps sweeter ales, whereas, of course, the chocolates and the black malts are going to be going into the porters and the stouts. And, of course, the ultimate is not to even malt the grain, just take the barley and put that straight into a roaster. And now you get roast barley. And, of course, that is the, uh, a key component of a product like Guinness, which with that very uh, harsh... Uh, character and that very intense color. Uh, of course, in the case of Guinness, they mellow it out by using nitrogen gas to, to smooth it out a bit. But that, that is the sort of characteristic you're going to get in a, in, in a stout. So, yeah, diff uh, a wide range of different malts. Um, and I think brewers can, can do, they're, they're starting to do it, but n n even more so, could they actually champion um, the diversity of malts that are available, just like they, they can with the hops as well. So that, you know, we could, you know, if there's anything we can learn from a, a winemaker, it's, it's how to uh, tell stories about our raw materials. Uh, <laughs> when, when you think they've only got one damn raw material um, that they worry about, and we've got all these different malts and hops and so on, we can, we can tell such wonderful stories about them. Um, and I think we, sh we could and uh, should do that even more than uh, we do already. Well, uh, you were talking for just a moment ago about the colors uh, that, that malt obviously asked, adds to the beer. I was wondering if you could talk about the Maillard reaction and, and how that comes into play. Yeah, so the Maillard reaction is this, this reaction between sugars and amino acids uh, where they, they basically meld together uh, with the, in the presence of heat. And um, first of all, they sort of they, the, the, the chemistry is quite complicated, but simply put, what they do is, is to actually uh, react together, first of all, to make fairly small complexes, which have got different flavors. And then as they get bigger and bigger, these complex materials get bigger and bigger. Uh, that is when uh, you develop the color. It's actually very interesting that, that, that there are products in the marketplace where people have take, take, <coughs> they take roast grain and they make an extract out of it. They extract it in water. Mm -hmm. And then they, they separate out the big molecules from the small ones. You can do that with a, a special type of filtration. And so you can get these very small molecules and the very big molecules in two separate fractions. And of course, the small molecules have got all this intense flavor, but no color. And you've got the, the bigger fraction with all this color and no flavor. So you can get these, uh, you know, these materials and if you wanted to produce a, you know, a very pale colored product with an intense roasted character, but no, you know, but not jeopardize the color, mm -hmm. you can do it. And vice versa, you can use these colored materials to add a lot of color without adding any roasted uh, uh, flavor whatsoever. So, um, so yeah, we, the brewer, uh, so the monster can, can deliver all sorts of possibilities to the brewer. Of course, the other source of color in a, in a beer uh, can also uh, is also uh, to an extent malt derived, but also hop derived. In mm -hmm. that, uh, malt and hops both have these polyphenols. In the malt, they are of course particularly uh, located in the the outer uh, regions, and um, of the grain. And uh, if they become uh, they are extracted into the wort, and if the wort is oxidized. Uh, then they they change color in just the same way that you you know you have an apple 
and you slice that apple in half and it, and it turns brown, that's because of the oxidation of polyphenols. And, and exactly the same thing can happen mm. in wort. And it's, it's obviously a much bigger problem if you've got a very lightly colored um, wort um, with lightly colored grain. If you've got a Guinness, for example, they're not desperately worried about the oxidation of polyphenols. <laughs> Well, uh, I was wondering if we could talk for a moment about foam. We did a whole episode on foam uh, probably a couple of years back now, but um, but malt obviously has a huge impact on foam. Yes, it does. Um, uh, and the main reason, of course, is what you're getting from the uh, the malt is protein. And uh, and that protein uh, is the, the backbone of, of foam. Um, obviously, we have done a lot of work on this over the years, and... and uh, uh, th th there are many, many proteins in beer, lots of different types. Um, it does appear that the most important of these proteins are, are a couple of them. One's called uh, protein Z, and the other one is is uh, called LTP1, that's for lipid transfer protein. And these do tend to uh, survive into the product, and uh, and therefore there they form the backbone of um, of the beer foam. Um, it's interesting actually that it's it's not simply a function of how much malt you've got. It does depend on the process. And, and it has been shown that it's in the boiling stage, when, when the wort is boiled, that you basically transform these, these proteins, um, particularly the lipid transfer protein, in a much more foam-positive condition. And um, we in my lab for a long time now, you know, way over 30 years, have been looking at this thing called hydrophobicity, uh, water hating, and when you boil, uh, you actually change the LTP one in a much more, mm -hmm. to more, much more hydrophobic condition, which will stabilize uh, the um, the foam. There is, however, um, well, another thing I, I'd point out is that for a long time people have believed that uh, when you intensely heat the grain uh, in producing some of these specialty malts. Uh, some of the uh, the proteins they sort of meld together with um, with the uh, carbohydrates, some of the uh, polysaccharides, and they form these complexes which are particularly foam stabilizing. And indeed, we have found uh, that things like black malt do have you know materials which are extremely wonderful at stabilizing foam. However, what we've also been found recently is is something which is quite contradictory to what the uh, received wisdom is and the dogmatic beliefs of people for the longest time and, and me included have put, talked about using some of the uh, caramel and crystal malts uh, to boost the foam uh, we've done a lot of work recently to show that they're actually uh, foam negative there's a lot of foam negative materials there hmm. and it would appear that they are uh, what we call lipids uh, you know the sort of materials like the fats and so on and they are foam negative of course um, so everybody knows that if you've got uh, fats and grease and detergent and so on in your beer glass, then it's going to kill the foam. Well, you know, there is lipid. This, these lipids, they're coming through from the process as well, coming through from the grain. So they're coming through from which grains? The crystal grains? Or? Well, yeah, we've, we've found them particularly in certain caramel malts, particularly mm. uh, contain, or crystal malts, contain these particular materials. And it looks like they are lipids. Um, it's uh, ironic because a lot of brewers add crystal malts trying to, uh, you know, increase the body of their beer. Yeah, ironically uh, enough, uh, but we, you know, I, we were shocked when we first discovered it, but we have done. It does differ for, from preparation to preparation. So there's something that we haven't totally got to the bottom of yet, something that's variable there, but the materials, many of the materials we've looked at uh, do contain foam negative materials. So mm. it, it is something that you've got to keep a, a careful eye on, uh, whether the, 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 these are, um, are they po positive or negative? We know full well that the positives outweigh the negatives in something like black malt, you know, but it, you can't put black malt into a grist if you want a lightly colored product, you know? Obviously, so, yeah. Ah, so it's, it is a, an interesting conundrum that we're, we're still trying to get to the bottom of. So it really, uh, malt, uh, I said already that, you know, wherever possible, I try to defend the maltster. Uh, but it may just be the case that uh, here is one um, area where the monster may have uh, a few problems in that there do seem to be some foam negative materials which are present in, in, in malt. Even the pale malts do actually, um, of course, they contain lipid. And it would appear that particularly when that <coughs> lipid 
uh, is is converted into an oxidized form that is particularly uh, damaging for foam. Probably for most malts, the, the positives out, outstrip the negatives, but uh, it, it is certainly not as simple a story as people uh, have thought. Well, that brings us to another topic that's a, sort of a catch-22, and that's uh, the effect of malts on beer clarity, right? Yes, it is. I mean, there's a, a number of materials can, that can make beer go uh, cloudy. I mean, the one that most people have studied over the years um, is the interaction between uh, proteins and uh, polyphenols, tannins. And, of course, both protein and uh, polyphenol are contributed by, by the malt. Um, so um, the proteins that seem to be involved in, in haze, uh, they're what we call the um, the so-called proline-rich proteins. They're, they're actually derived from the storage protein in the grain, the, the hordain. Um, mm -hmm. Now, right the way through the process, right the way through malting and in sweet wet production um, and also in boiling, uh, you're losing these proteins. And later on in the cold storage um, uh, of beer in the cold storage after fermentation, you are precipitating out protein. And of course, you can also, if you want to, you can remove it using various stabilization treatments downstream, uh, things like uh, silica gels and tannic acid and, and some enzymes. Uh, perhaps I can mention one of those later. Um, so, you, you know, a good brewer with good practice uh, using good malt, uh, it, uh, it's certainly very uh, straightforward to make sure that you don't have excessive amounts of protein that are going to cause haze. In terms of polyphenols, then um, the, the more extensively you try to extract the grain, the more polyphenols you're going to pull out. Mm. Um, so if, you, if you, you know, you're, you're collecting your wort and you keep going and, and sparging and going lower and lower gravities, uh, as you go to lower and lower specific gravities, you are going to be pulling out more and more of this um, polyphenol, which is going to be a clarity risk, but it's also, even more so to me, it's going to be a risk for flavor. It's going to give you more astringent and harsh, grainy character. That tannin kind of flavor, right? Cor correct. So um, the, the more you try to squeeze out that last little bit of extract, the, you know, <laughs> remember you're, you're actually pulling out one or two things that uh, you might actually prefer not to have there. But, uh, you know, Haze, you know, clarity, you should be able to sort it out fairly readily. Now, there are other materials in beer, of course, that can cause haze. And some of these do come from the malt. So if you don't properly break down the cell wall materials uh, during germination and possibly using a low temperature stand in mashing, then you're going to get uh, things like beta-glucans and pentosans, which come from the cell walls of the grain, and they're going to be present in the finished beer, and they can cause a clarity risk uh, as well. And, of course, there is also um, something we call oxalic acid in the grain, which if that gets into the beer, that can cause um, turbidity and bits in the beer. But also, even bigger problem, it's going gonna, it's gonna to progressively build up in dispense lines and pipes called beer stone and is, is, is going to uh, clog out. So the best way to get rid of that is to make sure you have plenty of calcium in the brew house to, to actually get rid of the oxalic acid at that stage. Um, so yeah, the, there's a whole range of materials in the finished product that, uh, that can cause beer haze. But uh, uh, a good brewer, knowing what they're doing, uh, they, they, for them, a haze uh, should not, uh, development with time, um, should not be a, a, a major problem. And we touched on this earlier, but uh, malts also play a significant role in long-term uh, flavor stability of the beer and the, and the stability overall of the beer. Yeah, stability overall, including, uh, of course, uh, flavor stability. Um, flavor stability is a much more complicated thing. Um, you know, what I'm fond of saying to my students is, you know, if you understand um, the various things that can cause beer to go hazy, uh, it's, it should not be a challenge. You can get rid of them. You can get rid of polyphenols, fairly straightforward. You get rid of them with PVPP downstream, for example. You can get rid of the haze-forming proteins. You should not have a beta-glucan problem. Of course, starch can cause a haze if it's not properly broken down. But, you know, you sh you, people should be able to break down starch, for goodness sake. Um, but with flavor stability, it, uh, flavor stability is due to all sorts of different things, all sorts of different flavor changes. And not all of them are anything to do with the malt. You know, a lot of them, for example, to, to do with the hops. I mean, the bitter acids in the hops, they break down to give stale flavors with time. And, and you can't blame the maltster for that. Um, where, where most people um, 
talk about flame stability in the malt, what they're, what they're talking about is uh, oxidation of lipids, uh, unsaturated fatty acids. And um, that's where most people are focused. And mm-hmm. it's certainly relevant. It's not irrelevant by any means. Um, but it's only one of the pathways that lead to the staling of beer. And uh, so I, I, I personally do not believe we're ready to blame the maltster yet for flavor instability. And what I always say is, look, if you want to tackle flavor uh, instability, you've got to work from the back and move forward. And you've got to worry about beer uh, storage, um, uh, cold, cold storage of the beer to keep it fresh longer. And you've got to worry about, if you're a big brewer, uh, a size of a distribution and refrigerated distribution. And you've got to worry about having the lowest level of oxygen possible in the final package. Mm-hmm. It's only when you've sorted all that out that you can progressively work back. And the last person to be blamed, in my opinion, is the maltster. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, some people are taking the shortcut and they're going back to the habits of a lifetime and, and they're blaming the maltster. It, uh, the malt is not going to be irrelevant in this context, but it's only uh, a part of the story. And I'm not personally convinced it's the major part of the story. And uh, related to that, gushing can be a problem in beer as well. And you mentioned uh, that could also be caused by malt, right? Well, not so much the malt itself, but any contamination on the malt. Uh, So this is uh, one of the big scare stories, certainly in Northern Europe, and again, in those damper regions, Mm -hmm where grain is susceptible to uh, contamination with things like fusarium. Uh, fusarium is seldom a problem in North America. But it, so it what, can, what's, it, what's fusarium? Because well, I think fusarium most people... is, Yeah, fusarium is a mold, and uh, it contaminates the grain, and it produces two things, neither of which we want. The first is a, a very, very small protein. We call it hydrophobin. And this is, uh, is, it forms these nucleation sites and it, it causes the, the bubbles to, to spontaneously form in beer. And uh, when you open your beer bottle, uh, whoosh, out comes the, the foam. And that, of course, is, is gushing. Um, the second thing that um, Fusarium produces is a toxic material called D-O-N, deoxynivalenol. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people call it vomitoxin, which says it all, doesn't it? And so, so we well, sure as heck... Yeah, we don't we don't want that in the product. Um, so whichever way you look at it, fusarium is really bad news. Uh, the, the bottom line is you can't blame the monster, well, uh, unless the monster has uh, chosen to buy contaminated grain. The problem uh, is in uh, in in looking after the grain uh, in in the field, make sure there's no risk of contamination. Now, let's be frank: some in some parts of the world. It is straightforward uh, to use um, uh, herbicides and, and fungicides and, and pesticides to make sure this is not a risk. And many, many maltsters and brewers don't like that. Uh, so you've got to manage it in a different way. And it is all to do with, with um, uh, checking for it. It's the best way to check for fusarium is to measure DON. So uh, often on a barley specification and on a malt specification, uh, you, you will see a line item for DON, um, which is this material that is a marker. And if it's there, then the chances are the grain is contaminated with mm. fusarium and you should not use it. Um, um, so uh, gushing is still an issue in some parts of the world. I do not recall in my time in the United States a gushing problem. Uh, over the last 16 years, I don't r- recall a gushing problem that is anything other than a localized problem for, for an individual brewery. Uh, certainly not so, nothing you can link to the malt. Mm-hmm. Uh, malt also plays a role in product safety and, as you ca- call it, wholesomeness. Uh, well, I want yeah, to talk yeah. about that. Well, yeah, I, I mean... The there's more good in malt than there is bad, you know. Let's let's deal with the bad, um, <laughs> and uh, this a, a scare story that cropped up uh, whoa, way back in the seventies, and it was all, it was to do with something called nitrosamines, and uh, a laboratory in Canada found that uh, in malt uh, there were these uh, nitrosamines, which are, are putative carcinogens, um, and um, they arise during malting. Um, on the kiln, when uh, you react together, something that's in the embryo with um, with uh, oxides of nitrogen that are in the atmosphere, and you make these nitrosamines. Well, the malting industry and the brewing industry responded extremely rapidly to that, and by the early 80s, it had been sorted out. And what happens is, on a kiln, 
these days when malt is kilned, you don't just uh, heat the air going through uh, the kiln bed. Uh, you actually uh, have an indirect um, uh, system whereby you have a heat exchanger. So the, the oxides of nitrogen basically are not seeing the flame, if you like. So you're not, you're, you're not producing these nitrosamines. Mm -hmm. So there is, again, on a, on a line item on malt, you will see a line item for something called NDMA, and that is the nitrosamine. And you'll find that it's very, very low. So uh, it, it's a wonderful example of how the malting and brewing industry very rapidly responded to this concern. So, you know, it, when, you're, when you're having your barbecue, don't worry about the beer. It's fine. I'm not too sure what's happening with the stuff on the kiln, on the, on the grill, but uh, the beer will be fine. Um, I prefer to consider all the benefits that there are in um, uh, malt. And um, one of them, of course, is, is uh, something that is on the surface of the grain that is a benefit, and that is the silica. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of silica that is washed off the surface of the grain now, uh, during the brewing process. Now, that's not uh, necessarily good news for beer stability in terms of clarity, but it sure is good news for the bodily health. Uh, beer is one of the richest sources of, of silica in the diet, and it has been shown to cut down the risk of osteoporosis. So uh, the, the, there's a very real benefit to that. Healthy bones. Absolutely. Somebody said to me, if, you, if you're a binge drinker, if you've got really good bones, I say, yeah, until you fall over. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, the, the cell wall material, uh, you know, things like beta-glucans, brewers worry about it. They try to get rid of it. But uh, if it is in beer and, and it survives to a certain extent in beer, if it's there, it actually uh, does uh, uh, contribute uh, soluble fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a significant amount of soluble fiber in beer. And we believe that, uh, that some of the breakdown products of the, of the beta glucans are, are probably prebiotics and they're, they're good for the organisms growing to, to benefit, benefit uh, your body in the large intestine. But that's still to be proven. But I suspect that is the case. Um, and on the cell walls as well, there is something called ferulic acid. That is an antioxidant, uh, which we know does actually get into the body and, and almost certainly does some good as an antioxidant in, in the body. Uh, the listeners may be interested to know that that ferulic acid is also the material uh, that uh, heifer yeast uh, transforms into the clovey flavor. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ferulic acid has got two roles in terms of quality of beer. One is as the antioxidant, uh, good for the body, but the other one is as the, the source of the clove flavor in an authentic Hefeweizen. I think, don't dark beers have a lot of uh, antioxidants as well? Um, yeah, but uh, I personally think that the, you know, people talk about the various polyphenols and the mm -hmm. ferulic acid. The thing that to me is most important is whether an antioxidant will get into the body or not. So um, when people talk about antioxidants in different foods, and of course they're fond of talking about them in red wine and hard cider and so on, what they do, they do a laboratory test and they, they compare antioxidants in a, in a test tube basically with a, a, a test that's easy to do and you get a color change and the bigger the color change, the more antioxidant. And they say, well, there's a lot of antioxidant in this material and there's less in that one. Uh, the more important point to me is that those antioxidants have actually got to get into the body. And uh, many of these antioxidants you can measure in a test tube are far too big to get into the body. Or they <laughs> stick onto something, you know, they stick onto a, uh, something in the mouth, uh, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So they don't actually get there. So the important thing is, does it get there? And, and all I can say at this point is we know ferulic acid does get into the body. There is one other point about uh, malt, of course, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, health, and that is the, the protein that uh, people with celiac disease and gluten intolerance are sensitive to. So we have to be mindful of that. Um, uh, you, um, you've got to remember that uh, uh, the hordein, uh, the storage protein in the, the grain, uh, that is similar to gluten in wheat. And the people with celiac disease are sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work in this area. And what we find is uh, uh, the largest amount of that protein is lost throughout malting and brewing. Mm -hmm. uh, the two key stages are the malt house in germination, but also in uh, the sweetware production, in the mash. There's a lot of protein lost. So the amount that's left behind in the finished beer is actually really rather low. Um, and there are some beers that you can get in the marketplace that, that have got levels which are below the recommended levels. 
Now, of course, it's all down to labeling. And because beer is made out of things like barley and wheat, you have to label it as such, and therefore people do avoid it. But there are beers in the marketplace now that are made out of malted barley, and they are labeled as gluten-free, if they're allowed to be labeled as such, or low gluten. And the way that is done is using an enzyme. Uh, there's a, a, one of the trade names is Brewer's Clarex, Mm -hmm. And this is an enzyme that is, is primarily marketed to, to get rid of haze proteins. I mentioned that earlier on. Uh, but also, it does get rid of these proteins that people with celiac disease are sensitive to. And so, can a, you mention that again? Somebody, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are gluten yeah, intolerant. Yeah, the, the enzyme is called Brewer's Clarex. And um, it's, it, well, if you want the fancy term, it's prolyl endoproteinase. But it is used by uh, at least one uh, prominent craft brewer in North America uh, to make um, a range of beers that are, are labeled in the, that their home state on the Pacific Northwest um, as, uh, as gluten-free. Nice. Um, so, um, and these beers, you know, people when they have these so-called uh, gluten-free beers, which are made out of uh, buckwheat and uh, 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 sorghum and who knows what else, quinoa and what have you. You know, as drinks, they're, they're fine, but they don't taste like mainstream beers. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can make beers using this particular enzyme that do actually taste mainstream. Mainstream, uh, malt, hoppy, you know, nice beers. And I, I personally find it extremely exciting. That's awesome. Uh, well, Charlie, you gave us a great overview today. I was wondering if, you, uh, if there's anything else you'd like to add on this topic. Uh, not really. I just, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of of, of malt, and, I, and I'm a big fan of maltsters. They're 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 tremendous people, and it's a tremendous product. Um, and uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in it. I, I I don't I don't decry those people who who seek to to supplement it using other materials if they want to do it for good reasons. Uh, and I'd talked about some of those earlier on, but but malt is is a great thing. There's one thing I didn't mention, and that is uh, the you know, classic lager character, the, the material called DMS. I think we've talked about it before. Of mm -hmm. course, that, we, that we did a whole episode on it actually. We did uh, some we time did. ago. Yeah. And, and so let's not forget that the the DMS, the ultimate source of that DMS, are a couple of precursors that are present in the malt. So you know, malt has uh, a tremendous uh, uh, impact in so many ways on, on, on beer, and it truly is the soul of beer. Uh, well, Charlie, I wanted to give you a minute at the end to mention uh, some of your recent books or projects, and uh, I do have your short courses too, if you want to. I've got it finally on the website here. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm busy completing several projects in the world of books at the moment. I'm a little bit behind, I have to tell you. So uh, I'm a little bit delayed in coming up with the fourth edition of uh, uh, the first beer book I ever did, which is uh, uh, Beer, Tap into the Art and Science of Brewing. But hopefully there'll be a fourth edition before too long. Mm -hmm. Working on the third edition, uh, third uh, volume in the series for the American Society of Brewing Chemists on quality. The first one was foam. The second one was flavor. The third one will be um, flavor stability and freshness. And hopefully I'll have completed that before too long. And you can uh, pick those up from the ASBC, right? ASBC. If you go again to go to my website, there's a uh, and, and it says buy the book, buy the book. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you you can click on all the various books and so on. And then of course uh, you know the the beer is proof. God loves us is now in paperback, um, and uh, that is the, the book, of course, which contains a lot more autobiographical information than perhaps should be there. But nonetheless, I think you can find that one on Amazon, right? Oh, yeah, you can find it on Amazon. There's, there's a few people hate it, but hopefully a little bit. But if you, if you do get it on Amazon, for God's sake, don't buy it Kindle. It'll drive you nuts. So get, get a hard copy. Uh, yeah, some, some books don't translate that well. Uh, this, one, this one doesn't. Trust me. This one doesn't. And then I wanted to put, mention your brewing short courses. I do have the website up uh, if you wanted to just talk for a moment about one or two of the new ones yeah. coming up here. Yeah, the, the main one I was referring to earlier on is, is uh, uh, Introduction to Practical Brewing. Uh, so the, 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 the one that uh, you can see on the screen. Yep, there, there it is near the bottom on this listing. 
Yeah, introduction to practical brewing. And uh, like I say I teach that four times a year. Uh, there's room for uh, 15, 16 people on it. And uh, we start on a Monday morning um, and, uh, and have a brief overview of the process. Then we go into the one and a half barrel brewery and uh, brew a beer. And then we carry on through the week. We brew again on the Wednesday and we go through the week and uh, go through everything from barley to beer in a degree of detail, but it's fun and it's knockabout. There's a, a visit down to the Sudwet Brewery in, in the Davis. And then we finish on the last day with some sensory work. We, we use the, some flavor standards to introduce people and confirm their knowledge of individual flavors. And as I say, we, we taste some beers, including the beers. And many of them are really good from the people who are coming to the class. We have all sorts of people on that class ranging from home brewers right the way through to uh, quite senior people in non-technical roles with big brewing companies. We've had daughters of prominent brewing companies, um, should remain nameless, but we've, we have all sorts of people that come along to, uh, to, to take part. And it, it's, it's a great, uh, it, it's great fun. And, uh, but it, it, you know, it's, it, it, it leaves people with a, a good sense of the, 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 the depth of the process. And of course you end up with a certificate that says University of California on the top and uh, you, you, you can frame that and, uh, and I'll have signed it. Sounds like a great week. Uh, and I, I, you know, I can recommend any of the UC Davis courses. Obviously, uh, you guys, you guys are a center for, for brewing knowledge here in the United States. And, um, oh, uh, we like to think, yeah. we like to think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you teach, uh, not only, gra- you know, undergraduate, graduate level, but now all these, uh, short courses I, I'm bringing up here. Um, yeah, it's, it's a busy life we have, but, uh, you know, uh, and of course there are, there are many courses springing up across, uh, across, uh, the nation. Uh, all I would say is look very carefully and make sure that it, uh, it's, it's being taught by people who, uh, who know their stuff and, uh, and hopefully people recognize that, um, I think we know our stuff here at Davis. Well, thanks again, Charlie. I really appreciate you coming on the show and congratulations again on your new position. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's always a pleasure. I, I enjoy it. It's nice to talk and, uh, and uh, it's, it's nice to do it with a smile on the face as well. So thanks a lot. We enjoy having you on. Thanks right. again uh, today to my guest, Dr. Charlie Bamforth, a distinguished professor at the University of California at Davis. Uh, Charlie, uh, uh, thanks again. Great wishes. Uh, best wishes. All right. Thanks a lot, Brad. Bye. Well, thank you again to Dr. Charlie Bamforth for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, where you can get your 15% discount on their magazine or anything in their store if you use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 when you shop at beerandbrewing.com. Again, use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 and get your subscription now at beerandbrewing.com. Finally, take a look at the How to Brew Extract and All Grain videos I co-authored with brewing author John Palmer. You can watch the trailer or order these full-length videos online or on DVD at beersmith.com DVD. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.